everybody. Welcome to the Al Franken podcast. Uh, I'm Al Franken. And uh, today we're going to talk uh, on a light subject, nuclear weapons. And our guest is Joe Cerencioni, who happens to be the president of the Plowshares Fund. Now, I worked with uh, the Plowshares Fund for a, a long time, I went, when I was in the Senate, certainly. They're a, a group that is trying to get us to spend less money, for example, on nuclear weapons and to have reasonable disarmament talks with other nuclear powers. And they get their name from a quote in the Book of Isaiah, which um, I read every night. Okay, here, <laughs> here it is. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift sword upon nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So they had to choose between uh, we're going to be the plowshares fund or the pruning hooks fund, and I think they chose wisely, and they have been great leaders on this uh, extremely important task. So we're going to discuss that with uh, Joe. We may get into, I'm not sure, Representatives Omar and Talib uh, not going to Israel. These are the only two Muslim women who are members of Congress. Ilhan Omar is, is actually my member of Congress. I think you know the story. Um, President Trump urged Netanyahu not to let them come in and and it got very complicated. Uh, finally, they were going to let Talib in, Congresswoman Talib, to visit her 90-year-old grandma, and she chose not to go to the West Bank, uh, the occupied West Bank, to visit her 90-year-old grandma because she said the conditions that were put on her to uh, not talk about BDS, the, the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, that... Uh, she wouldn't go under those conditions. You got a 90-year-old grandma, you know? Go there and say, I think this is terrible. I can't talk about that that stuff, and I will when I get home, but I want to see my 90-year-old grandma because although I will say she looked pretty tough, 90-year-old grandma, and she put a curse on Trump, and the curse wasn't, it was okay. It was may his hair start to thin and turn gray. And I don't think she realized that he, he's been dyeing the hair for quite a while and that it has thinned out without the curse. So I think this is going to be a good one uh, for a change. So enjoy. Now, Joe, I got to get I, I, I got to get your pronunciation right. Uh, Joe uh, Cercione. Almost. Cercione. This a lot more not syllables. even close. Not more syllables than you think, but you got the C right. Serencioni, like Serencioni, Serencioni. <laughs> Joe Serencioni <laughs> is uh, my guest today here on the uh, Al Franken podcast, and uh, Joe is head of Plowshares, and uh, is it Plowshares from the world, America? It's just Plowshares. Just Plowshares Fund. Yeah, it's we get the name from the uh, the Bible. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. But now it's sort of in the, in the missiles. We, we focus on nuclear since yeah. I've been president. But I mean, the, the plowshares are, are being shaped in the missiles. <laughs> That's right. So we don't want to beat the missiles, but we do want to stop building more of them. That's exactly right. What are the chances of that? In my lifetime, uh, not very good. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have you to work? understand, listeners, that, uh, that Joe is 97 <laughs> years old, which gives us all a little bit of hope. It's in the balance. We're at a tipping point now. The reduction process has stopped. All the nuclear-armed countries are building more. There's a new nuclear arms race. So this is to be determined. Depends what we do. Let, let, let me ask you. So this missile that blew up, uh, it yeah. looks like it blew up in Russia, right? What they what they wanted there was a nuclear powered missile. Yes. Okay, explain that. It's it's in other words, it's not jet fuel or whatever. It's a nuclear engine right. 
within the missile. So even if you don't care anything about nuclear arms control or nuclear weapons, this is just really don't. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is just real. So this is a, uh, a cruise missile. So you basically have two kinds of missiles. Mostly we talk about ballistic missiles. They go power, they go up in the atmosphere, they glide, then they come down, pulled by gravity. Okay, I know that. Oh, well, most people don't. The how a missile works. It goes up and it comes down. And it's and what that means is the, it's the, got a predicted course. People who listen to the Al Franken podcast, I'd say 40% know that, uh, at least. I will take that bet. But, but okay, let's go on. So that's a ballistic missile. That, well, this, yeah, okay. that means it's predictable. It has a predictable path. So if you detect right. it, you can plot it, and maybe you can put something intercept up there it. that will intercept it, maybe. And if there's how many how many uh, missiles do they have? Uh, uh, long-range uh, ballistic have. missiles? Yeah, long uh, Several hundred. They have hundreds of Okay, these. so we, we'd have to Subs hit all. Subs and base. Yeah. Almost oh. all 100. Oh, and you could lose one city. Is, is, <laughs> is this a missile command? You know, is, like you can lose a couple cities and it's okay. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's hard. So it's, I, it's, I say it's, it's impossible to do that. Right. But. Mm -hmm. But the Russians and or anyone, that, we better not rely on it. And that's what Star better, Wars was going to be. <laughs> that was Reagan's thing, which was we were going to just have these anti-ballistic missiles and intercept them all. And we were going to protect America from missiles the way a roof protects a family from rain. That's what Ronald Reagan said. Impossible. Well, um, that's, uh, that's what he did. You know, I always like to say that uh, a wise man once said, trust but verify, and that man was quoting Ronald Reagan. <laughs> well, he did. Reagan really believed you could do this. He was sold a bill of goods. And, this... and a lot of Americans actually think we have it, like we have a defense that if somebody shoots a missile at us, that we can shoot it down. And that's because a lot of our generals tell us that, and a lot of our political leaders tell us that. Nonsense. No, won't happen. Uh. Chance of doing it are, are minuscule. But suppose yeah. you do think that the other side has a missile defense system that can shoot yours down. Then what you want is a system that can't be shot down, and that's the cruise missile because it goes under the defenses. It doesn't have a predicted trajectory. It can go. We and can how leave. far it's can like a, jet. a cruise missile ah, go? So this, now we're getting That's why it. the nuclear engine. Is exactly. Because oh, most, you, you you, uh -huh. most cruise missiles. Most cruise missiles. I read the paper. <laughs> You know, they carry jet fuel, and so they run out. So They, they run out of jet uh, fuel. You know, 1,000 kilometers or so, not very long range. But at most, at most, more like a couple of hundred, most of them. But what you can do, what if you had a fuel that didn't run out? What if you could put a nuclear reactor on the back of your cruise missile, <laughs> and that nuclear reactor would propel the missile forward? And here's how it does it. The heat of the reactor is immense. It's intense, you know, as hot as the sun. And so it heats up the air and sends it out the back of, of the missile and propels it forward. That means you could keep this cruise missile going for very long distances or very long times, weeks at a time. It could go thousands of miles. In other words, you could launch it this could cruise missile. It could go around the Earth several times? Is that what you're as, saying? As long as you wanted it to. But it could at least go across the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and now you have an intercontinental cruise missile, which has never existed before, and you have a system that a missile defense system cannot shoot down under any circumstances. Okay, and they have control over it, obviously. Yes. They, they, okay, so in other words, this is sending out a cruise missile that they have complete control over, and they can have it go around, uh, orbit the Earth several times, and then, and then decide, mm, we haven't hit Cincinnati yet. Go to Cincinnati. That's Boom. exactly right. So we had this idea Jesus. back in the 1950s. The people were working on what we called Project Pluto. This was designed, it started in the 1950s and continued through the 1960s, which was a very large missile about the size of a, a locomotive. That, yes, gigantic. <laughs> well, this one that we're talking oh, about okay. is about the same size. It's a, oh, yeah. They're, they're I would big. think how big is a nuclear <laughs> engine? Well, this well, so yeah. In in the one we were going to design, it would it would carry sub bombs. It would have little bombs, and it would fly over the target area, Russia, and loiter around, and could be dropping bombs, move on to another city, drop another bomb, etc. And this was going to be powered by a. A nuclear reactor in exactly the way I described. Heat the air, put it through a ramjet, propel it forward. And if you were worried about something, a crisis coming out, the idea was you could send it over the oceans and it could loiter for a while. So that was the idea. Never worked. 
we could never get it to work. I mean, he had big engineers. But this one, this one the Russians have developed evidently works, well, except for exploded. Well, they've except had for that it. part. U.S. intelligence reports this is probably somewhere around its 14th test, the longest test that we've been able to detect, only lasted about two minutes, so it's not been very successful, and this one exploded. And one of the problems with this thing is that the reactor, you know, in order to fit it on a missile, there's no shielding. So there's no lead walls, there's no concrete, so that means this thing just spews radioactivity. So for us, this became completely unacceptable because we'd have to be flying over, say, Europe with this cruise missile, and it would radiate all the territory it was flying over. And we decided this was too unworkable, too cruel, too stupid even for us. We canceled the project at 64. <laughs> too stupid even for us? <laughs> even Is that for what us. you just said? Yes, even okay. in those nuclear nuts days when we were building all kinds of okay. nuclear weapons on all kinds of platforms. So here the Russians come, right. and they say, okay, we can do this. And they've been trying to do this. And what appears to have happened is there is some fuel in the cruise missile. In order to, you have to get it up to a certain speed in order for the ramjet to work. You have to get it going, flying very fast in order for the, the heated air to be able to go in and come out at the acceptable speed. And apparently what happened was the f rocket fuel blew up and blew up the nuclear reactor. So you had radioactivity spewing into the atmosphere, now, into th the ocean. this was flying. This was in it's the air? It's unclear. We don't know yet whether it was flying or whether it was back on the barge. It appears to have been on the ship. Really? Yes, when okay, it blew up. Okay, so it wasn't, um, hmm. Okay, so it's, it's how not, did it blow up just on, sitting on the barge? Oh, uh, well, you know, rockets blow up all the time. And this is why you don't make nuclear rockets. They blow up all the time. So is HBO got another Chernobyl in a few <laughs> years? Is that what we're saying here? Is well, the, that this know, is essentially that? HBO, yes. It's a mini Chernobyl. It's a, but it's smaller. I mean, this was a, uh, the Chernobyl, of course, was a major nuclear reactor. This is a small mini reactor. That show really influenced people's view of this. They really understood, one, what it means that you have radiation spreading over a large area. And, and they understood the Russian reaction, which was just like it's depicted in Chernobyl. They didn't tell you anything. They denied right. anything was going on. They put out false story after false story. We still don't know the whole, the whole truth. And how many have died, or have they said died? Seven died that we know of, oh, yeah. and five of those oh. were Rosatom scientists and engineers, the people who work for the Russian nuclear mm -hmm. agency. That's one of the reasons we know this was actually a nuclear accident, nuclear. One of the clues that makes us think it was this Russian missile called, <laughs> the NATO designation is Skyfall. Which is the Bond movie. The Bond movie, Skyfall. About Fall. a Russian missile that fails. No, it, it wasn't. Okay, so now let, let's talk about this in terms of the nuclear arms race. Oh, yeah. Because what I think I'm seeing here is that the United States and Russia, starting, I guess, with Russia here, have given up on arms control. Yes. I, I have the feeling that Putin wants the Russian people to think we're, we're back. <laughs> we're back. We're a superpower, and we're going to invest all this, uh, this capital in being a superpower, which means mm -hmm. we're really dangerous. We, we can, uh, we're going to be a, a threat again to the United States and the rest of the world. And then the United States, here in the United States, the, uh, Trump and other scientists and, and thinkers in, in this area are going like, they're coming up with new technology. It isn't enough to have the overkill that we have in missiles that used to be fine, but now things are, the new technology, technology doesn't stop, and if we stop developing anything, we're going to fall behind, and not just them, but the, but the Chinese. That is exactly right. Ah, and each okay. of the nuclear armed states views the situation exactly like that, that it's the other guys that are racing, and so therefore they have to race. They have to keep up. And uh, I think all of them are somewhat right, and all of them are wrong. And what you produce is this dynamic where everybody is responding to the other person's moves and that means that every single nuclear armed nation, there's nine of them in the world, are building new nuclear weapons. We are off and running. We're not on the brink of a race. We're not in danger of a race. We, we, we're in the race. If you miss the 1980s, this is what it looked like. This is what a nuclear arms race was like in the 1980s, slightly larger scale, 
but it's like this now, especially between the U.S. and Russia, who have about 95 percent of all the world's nuclear weapons. They are each building new weapons, new kinds of weapons, and developing new doctrines for how to use those weapons. Okay, which brings us to the solution of that would be uh, some kind of summit yes. with the Chinese, the Russians, and us. Um, we have just the right president for that, uh, someone with uh, carries a lot of respect and weight around the world. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you about, in, in the last Democratic debate, we had uh, a little bit of a debate between Elizabeth Warren and, and Governor Bullock, of yes. Montana, he he wanted to keep the first strike capability. Yes, which says that there are situations in which the United States may want to be the first to use yes. nuclear web. What are those situations? We haven't had one in seventy four years. I know the, that. Right. Well, think about that for a minute. The U- U.S. is the first and only nation but we've to come use close. nuclear weapons. We've come close. But we we have been in a lot of wars. We've lost a lot of wars. We've lost brave men and women. We've had our allies lose. We've had efforts. We had the Joint Chiefs sometimes suggesting we nuke, for example, Cuba. We had the French when they were under siege from Dien Bien Phu asking us to drop nuclear weapons on the Viet Minh. We've had dozens of incidents like that. A president has never decided to use a nuclear weapon because they know that it's crossing a threshold. Of course, of course, of course it is. So what I'm wondering about is well, first of all, Secretary Perry, William Perry, right? Yes, uh, has written a book, and in it he yeah. t- opens with a false positive that they yes. detect from the Soviet Union. Now, if this technology is coming faster, which I would assume, w- does the nuclear-powered missile travel <laughs> faster? No, it the doesn't. Ballistic, ballistic missile is the fastest. You it would fly from one continent to another in about thirty minutes. Okay. And, and, and of that time, you have about 25 minutes when you see it coming before mm-hmm. it hits. And of that time, the president would have about seven minutes upon notice to discuss and decide whether to Jeez. launch a retaliatory well, strike. Fortunately, it would be so, the longest seven minutes of his life. <laughs> well, well you know, I, mm-hmm. I have my own podcast called Press the Button. And in there, we do a, a news segment, and we time the news segment for seven minutes just to illustrate how short a time that is. You do it's that every, seven, every podcast? Every, every week, early warning. Yeah. Wow. And press the button. So we and, Let's do that and, and on this one. Because it's an impossibly Starting short now. Time. I mean, you can't decide <laughs> w- whether you want to go out to see a movie in seven minutes. You know, who's going to decide whether they should launch a, a nuclear weapon? If your wife says, decide. <laughs> So then you decide already. Then then you 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 either you go or in this case you press the button and you launch the a war. And the problem is, as William Perry just des- describes, is you have false alerts. You ha- also, you think it's happening. I mean, every indication is that you are under attack. You think it's happening, but you're not. And that's when it's just a question of machines failing, of practice tapes being slipped in by accident to the early warning system, things like that, a misinterpreting a rocket launch as the Russians did in 1995. They thought they were under attack, and Yeltsin was asked to press the button, and, and they decided not to. But what happens in this world where you have cyber attacks exactly. where people are might be intentionally trying to provoke you into launching where you don't know if you've been hacked and everything looks real on your screens all your computer indicators are, are, are blinking red the way they're supposed to and you launch and it turns out you've been spoofed so that's you know why you have to have start to think about a change in doctrine that we don't have to do that. We don't, this is called launch under attack or launch on warning. You don't have to do that. You don't have to launch your missiles first unless they're ICBMs like, like Governor Bullock has in Montana. He has 150 ICBMs in Montana. Would, he would like to keep those, those jobs and those contracts in the state of Montana. Would, and his justification is these are what you need, but there's a liability with those ICBMs. If you are, in fact, under attack, they get hit and they're gone. On the subs, for example, they're, the ones that Adam Smith has in the state of Washington, they're invulnerable. You can't find them. Let, you don't let me have ask to you about. Let me uh, ask you about them. The, the, the missiles in North Dakota and in oh yeah, in Montana. Do we need those? No, I don't think you do. I how much do they cost? 
Well, we're to, about to have there. and maintain, and then are we are we building new ones or are we updating the old? I don't know what that even means. Glad I don't know you what asked. That means. So North Dakota has a has a missile base about 150. Montana has a missile base, and then there's one out in uh, it straddles Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. So 150. About now are we giving up missiles. secret information? Here? No, no. <laughs> you can you can look at this. You can do sky searches on Google Earth. You can see the silos. Not only is there nothing secret about it, I mean, there's obviously fences and guards and things like that. Yeah. But under the arms control agreements, START, Ronald Reagan's treaty, and New START, Obama's treaty, we have reciprocal inspections. So Russians come to mine it all the time. Oh, okay. And they do inspections. They have satellites that are allowed to photograph. We have lots of verification. Okay. And this is why a lot of the military likes arms control because it gives them predictability. It gives them verifiability. They can understand what the other side is doing, and they're not going to be uh, That's caught a by very, surprise. very, very good idea. I don't even know what kind of arsenal, nuclear arsenal, the Chinese have. What do they have? What, they how have many? fewer than 300 weapons, about 40 to 60 of which are on long-range missiles that can uh, reach us. So that's a relatively small arsenal. That's all they've wanted to build. I mean, they could build it uh, larger, but they have something they call minimum deterrence. They correctly uh, realize that that's all you need that's, to deter the United States. We're not going to attack China. I mean, it, one city lost in an attack on China, if they launched one nuclear weapon against it, would be unacceptable. Ten remember, would be a remember catastrophe. Remember Failsafe, the movie Failsafe? Exactly. Henry Fonda, he has to let the Soviets uh, bombed New York City yes. because we screwed up and bombed Moscow, yes. right? And his wife is shopping. That day. That's exactly right. That's exactly and right. I can just, you know, can you imagine Trump having to decide, am I going to bomb the city Melania is shopping? Well, at? more importantly, is Trump Tower is in. Yeah, but that means he gets to rebuild yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> in our radioactive wasteland. <laughs> yes. So when you but bring anyway, it down to that level of this, one city, this is this is this is dark, and, dark stuff. By and, the way. Well, yeah, we're talking about the end of human civilization. We're talking about no, nuclear we war. It is. It is dark. So the Chinese have about three hundred. The U.S. and Russians have about two thousand mm -hmm. in their operational stockpiles. This is all their long-range missiles that can reach continents plus another 200 or so uh, short-range weapons and he what they call hedge, plus another 2,000 or so that are in various states of um, dismantlement. So all told, the U.S. and Russia have about 6,000 each. China has about 300. France, U.K., about 200. India, Pakistan, about 150. And then North Korea is knocking on the door. They got about enough material for maybe 20 or 30, maybe a little more. And that's the nuclear world right there. It's not many nations. Most of the countries in the world do not have nuclear weapons. There's only nine that do. There's only two that have a lot of them. So, you know, and the, the reason we're down to these numbers, which sound like a lot. That's a lot of nuclear yeah, weapons. Yeah, this is... Uh... But they're used to all told, you add it all up, there's 14,000 nuclear weapons in the world. But when Ronald Reagan started the reduction process back right. in the 1980s, there was 70,000, 70,000 nuclear weapons. And we've been coming down ever since until now. And now the reduction process has stopped. There's no further reductions. There's no talks about further reductions. There's no talks about talks. I don't even hear this on the debate stage. We haven't had enough candidates, evidently, to really talk about this. I well, mean, shouldn't? We haven't had a media that's been interested in asking them the question. We've had plenty of time to get into this. But when Jake Tappert asked Elizabeth Warren that question, it was a gotcha question. He knew that she, what her position was and the way they asked the question. this was the first strike thing. This, he said, why would you want to tie America's hands by saying you wouldn't be the first one to use a nuclear weapon? And she gave a great answer on this, that you want to reduce instability. We're never going to do it anyway. We, we don't want anybody to do this. You want to establish the principle that no one should ever be the first to use a nuclear weapon. It, does it stop somebody from breaking that pledge? No. But it's one further restraint, one, one barrier that you, you know, have if you, to You know, if cross. you break a pledge just once, <laughs> <laughs> how big a deal is it? No, uh, but, but I would rather that, I mean, okay, the first strike thing is, I mean, we still, that's our policy, though. No, our, no, policy, our, our policy is to, is to first strike. Yeah. And this is the problem, because when you start talking about the money, you know, all these weapons, I didn't mm -hmm. get to answer this year, those 
missiles that are under the great prairies of, of America are wearing out. These were ordered under uh, Ronald Reagan, and they wear out eventually. They got a 30, 40 year lifespan. So if you want to keep them, which we have apparently do. You got to build a new one. That'll cost you $120 billion and about $2 trillion total to replace all the bombers, subs, missiles, and warheads that we have. So we're looking at that kind well, of we got, deal. We have, the, we have a triad. Yes. And we got to keep two legs of the triad. Okay. Okay. To, you, to have a deterrent. And a lot of people recommend that. Right. And I think the ones in, uh, in Montana and the Dakotas, et cetera, I'll be the one we don't need. That's exactly right. I like an idiot. Um, Obama invites the Democratic caucus in the Senate to the White House. I raise my hand. I go, why, why do we need <laughs> these ICBMs? Why, do we, why don't we? So, we, we have enough to turn. We, wow, wow, wow. From, not this, from Obama, but from your fellow senators? From, yeah, yeah. From, uh, yeah. I don't want to say who. Well, I can tell you. This is, there's a, in the Congress. But maybe you okay. you were not a member Tester, of it. Tester, obviously. Montana. Montana, right? So, so it might it's have the senators from North Dakota. It's yeah, a, they, they called it the ICBM caucus. People don't, they think this is, I'm making well, this I did up. Not, see, I should have known it's that. It's an ICBM caucus, and it's all about jobs. Also, also. So it's 12 Other 12 jobs, states. because the labs are elsewhere, too. Right, California. Uh, New, Mexico, New Mexico. They spread these uh, jobs around. Yeah. Very smart. And it's not a lot of money. You're know, talking about maybe 2,000 jobs in Montana, not a lot of money. You're talking about, say, Lawrence Livermore. It's about a $2 billion budget. But, man, they cling to those jobs. They cling to those contracts. How good a job is that? How good a job? I mean, it, are there literally guys and women who spend their careers with another person because you need two to launch, right? You need two to launch. If you're in the silo, you got to have two. It's a dual. Key That's system. not someone's whole career. They is it? And it's Sitting not someone's in the whole silo? career. Uh, but, but it's a missile control launch officer, and they can spend uh, two to five years in that job. I know. Wow. Being a missile uh, officer uh, is, is is not a, a desirable job. I mean, it's, it's for a lot of people. It's not their first choice. That's where they are. That's where they're stuck. Sure, in. but I mean, what does? Ah, the, the, you don't know what the job entails. Like what you, you're not sitting someplace waiting for the call. You're going around. You're dusting. It's you're, a small you're polishing. The ship. missile control uh, chamber is a. It's a small area. Uh, it's, but you, do you it's have a little to larger than there? this studio. You but have not, to be in the chamber. You're on shift. Sure, you're on shift. You know, twelve hour shift. You'll you'll be there. Yeah, you go down, and and that's where you are. And then you spend the rest of the time on base. Then you go back for another shift. That that's your job, twelve hours. Yeah, yeah, it's and pretty boring. Okay, but you're, there are two people. Two people. Okay, so if you get to know the other guy, you better like him. You're in that in that little room for a long time, and then they do drills there. You know, keep people active. So sure. one of the things you have to keep practicing and making sure that that, that you will follow the order. They right. don't want people questioning you. This is as close to an automated system as you can get with having people involved. <laughs> when they give the order to go. We've got the code from go. President Trump. That's exactly right. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, you what? You don't want, they are trained not to have that moment. So some people think, well, look, even if the president of the United States is crazy, even if the law gives him unfettered authority to launch a nuclear weapon whenever he wants, mm -hmm. for whatever reason he wants, Surely the military wouldn't carry out an insane command, would they? Well, you know, at one, at one point, remember when that anonymous letter came out to the New York Times from someone within the White House? Yes. So I, I just tweeted this. I said, uh, now is not the time for the Secretary of Defense, Mattis at the time, to tell the president they're withholding the nuclear codes from him. Now is the time to give him the wrong codes. <laughs> well, you know, so on the one hand, that's yes, you don't want the president to have that authority. On the other hand, wait a minute. You know, we've worked a, uh, we've worked yeah, you're hundreds of years. You're violating the Constitution, but... <laughs> you're violating the Constitution. But, we have civilian control of the but, military in this country. You know, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. idea. You want the military to do what the civilian president says. I know. I know. 
<laughs> but maybe this one time, is that but, what you're thinking? I mean, uh, Secretary Mattis, you're being court-martialed for saving the planet. <laughs> and <laughs> we, you're hereby sentenced to life. In prison, and then we're actually going you know, <laughs> to let you go. <laughs> let you go. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. I but just... you remember, there was a great movie, one of the great movies of the, of the 50s Dr. and Strange 60s. Love? That was a great movie, too, but Fail I was safe. thinking of Seven Days in May. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Seven yeah. Days in May. This is uh, Kirk Burt Douglas Lancaster. and Burt Lancaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Burt Lancaster is the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he leads a coup against the President of the United States. Do you know why? Because he was negotiating an arms control treaty with the Soviets. And he thought, this is, this is surrendering America. And this, the whole issue was about who runs this? Who do you trust? Uh, Kirk Douglas, fortunately, is his chief of staff, and he sides with the president, and he helps thwart the coup. But this is the whole issue. You do not want the military to have control of the nuclear weapons and have right. ultimate authority and whether they can be used or not. So we're On principle. <laughs> <laughs> On principle. Okay, let's get away from... Uh these horrible scenarios. I just think that it would be good for one of the presidential candidates to say, do you realize how many resources, how much money goes into these things? If we could negotiate so we all didn't have to spend this, we could be doing some great stuff with that. And we could mm -hmm. be uh, educating therapists for the guys who've been in the the missile silos, and we could, uh, and for everybody else who's lived through the Trump administration, we, we could address climate change, for example. I mean, wouldn't it be a much smarter use of those resources? And all China and uh, the Soviet Union and France and Great Britain and India and Pakistan and Israel, which I guess has it. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention Israel, yes. Yeah. All of them, except for us, are, <laughs> are uh, signatories to the uh, Paris Accords. Oh, yes. And just think about, you know, you go, guys, guys, let's just talk about not spending our nut on booze and, and Coke. Let's spend it on the kiddies. Uh, let's spend it on uh, their future. Right, right. Well, this is exactly why this is no longer an issue just for nuclear wonks or just for the national security community. Because you leave it up to the national security community, you know, that's dominated by defense contractors and defense contractors fund and think tanks who do studies to say, yes, keep building more weapons. You're going to keep spending this money. Right. Right. So we got two trillion dollars. I want to go to an weapons. expert on this. Right. So you somebody from <laughs> <laughs> General Dynamics. <laughs> yes. You've been studying this for 30 years, haven't you? Yes. And I'm afraid we're going to have to build some new systems. <laughs> that is exactly what they say. That's exactly the way they talk. Did I do talk. a good impression? Well, you the got the, the, the baritone voice, the seriousness, the, you know. It's going to cost a lot of money. But? But uh, it's the only thing we can do. It's the only thing we can do for the survival of our, of our democracy and our nation. Yes. And we owe it to the men and women in uniform. Let's throw that in there. We owe it to the men and women in uniform. There we are. There See? we are. And, then, and that's See? in this. And this works. And this works. Oh, no, he wouldn't say that. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I, <laughs> no, just... I, mean, I mean, this rap, this line of thinking, this, rap, this, this works. Okay, but so if you leave it to the national security community and the, uh, the, the contractors and the lobbyists who swarm all over Capitol Hill, you were on the receiving end of, the, of a lot of that, you're going to keep getting. I'd say, seven... get out of here, you. <laughs> You, I know what you're up to. Get out of my office. You're going to keep getting 700. Oh, you'll max out? Huh. <laughs> come back, come back, come back. I see. Okay, but I may vote against you. <laughs> you were lobbied by defense contractors, right? They did not come to me. Minnesota? I think they knew, not a lot of contracts in Minnesota? There are contracts in every state. You know that. <laughs> they right. give contracts. There's a reason for that. Yes. They do that. They create jobs in every damn state. Every congressional district. Yeah. yeah. Because one thing I learned, and we were going to talk about Israel, and first, uh, when I went to Israel as a senator, 
the first time. I had been there before, but when I went there before, I met with uh, the Knesset, met with mm-hmm. members of the Knesset. And I realized that they all, every member of the Knesset represents all of Israel. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, 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 it's small, so that makes sense, but they, it's because they have this parliamentary system and everybody who, it, it's each party gets as many members as, um, as a percentage basis of, of, of their vote in the general election. In, uh, in the United States Senate, you represent a state. So what you're worried about are the jobs in Minnesota or the jobs in North Dakota or the jobs in New Mexico or Tennessee. I could name all 50 states, (laughs) but I think you get the idea. So that's why these defense contractors put pieces of these projects in every state. Exactly. Exactly. I was. I used to work on the House Armed Services Committee in the 80s, and I remember when they had this breakthrough with the B-1 bomber, they placed a contract for the B-1 bomber in every single congressional district. 435 <laughs> congressional... I don't know what the hell these, some of these people made, but there was 435 There is a... Screws, I don't know what... There is a uh, screw which has <laughs> um, uh, a special uh, head that you have to screw in. So we have the, you have the screwdrivers. <laughs> that's in a different and district. This, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So you, you can't leave it up to them. You know, there's no way that the people who want to have arms control or want to cut the nuclear budget can succeed if they just work among themselves. It's got to form alliances. And there's no way that people who want Medicare for all can afford that if you keep spending this kind of money on nuclear weapons in the military budget, you might not be able to afford Medicare, let alone. And if you want the Green New Deal, where do you think you're going to get that money? Well, that, that's the one. I mean, you've got to have trade-offs. I you mean, gotta, theoretically. And this can also the give single you Single payer is, is less expensive. If you look at Canada, if you look at every other developed nation, covers everybody. And there's reasons to believe that you don't have to pay more for our health care, in fact. There's evidence that if you have universal Mm -hmm. care, that you can pay significantly less. So, but certainly. The Green New Deal requires major new investments. The Green New Deal or, uh, you know, some version of the addressing uh, climate change. The point is that we can be spending these resources instead of on. How about, how about, okay, let's go to this. The uh, Space Force. We're we're the Space Force. That's another thing. Every branch of the service has an incredible theme. (laughs) Off we go into the wild blue yacht from the halls of Montezuma as the caissons go marching along. I mean, (laughs) they're great great, songs. Except, can you do the Coast Guard? (laughs) No, No, you can't. (laughs) You can't. And and if you go to any Veterans Day or Memorial Days, they have a, a band that plays them all. You have veterans there, and they stand up when their uh, branch, uh, their theme is played. And every one of those is, is, is a brilliant, moving, spectacular theme, except <laughs> <laughs> the Coast Guard... And there aren't that many. The Coast Guard isn't that many. So you get this one guy who stands up to this. You know, not every piece of music can be great. We've learned that. <laughs> you get an octopus's guard every once in a while. You know? <laughs> what I'm trying what's, to what's say the is the Space Force. Force. Yeah. What the hell? Oh, Why no. do we need the Space well, Force? And, and, and is that going to be nuclear? I mean, is, or shouldn't we de-weaponize space or un, not de-weaponize it, but not allow? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When the Space Force idea was first announced, there was a, number, a couple of great articles reporters did on the origin of where, the, of where this came from. And you won't be surprised to find out that it came from the aerospace industry. This is an idea that has been promoted <laughs> by defense contractors yeah. to set aside a portion of the budget for satellites and 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 and, and, and missiles and launch vehicles and to and to guarantee that they would get continue to get a big chunk of, of the dollars. Well, we have and, to have and an appeal to Donald Trump, who for whatever reason, and he he embraced this fringe idea. The Air Force doesn't like it. The Joint Chiefs don't like it. They don't think we need this. 
And so now they're in one of these dances where they're trying and to And he brings it up every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to cheers for this crowd. But it, it, it seems like demilitarizing space yeah. would be an excellent idea. Now, the Chinese are working on anti-satellite yes. weapons, right? Yes, yes. And that's friggin' scary because then you can blind us, right? Yes, yes. Yep. And even so, the testing of them is dangerous. You put hundreds, thousands of fragments into low Earth orbit, you're going to knock out lots of the satellites we depend on for our basic, for going to the ATM, for example. It's, but it but how, do, how do those work? I, uh, my how does your feeling... anti satellite weapon work? Yeah, yeah. It's a ground launch missile, or sometimes it's, it's put on, a, we, we're, one version we had, we put it on an F 15, brought it up as high as we could go, and then launched it into space. And it's basically an air to air missile, except it goes uh, into space. And again, you're dealing with something that has a predictable trajectory. So you know the satellite's going around. You know exactly where it's going to be at what right. particular time. So you can put, plot an intercept. And, and what do they do? They put a satellite in the space and then, and then blow it up? Well, that's another version. So instead of you can have a direct ascent anti-satellite weapon that just goes up and goes right at the satellite and blows it up. And there's another uh, version where they're killer satellites. So you put them up in space, and okay. they maneuver close to the, uh, the target satellite. Okay, isn't it time it that we had a treaty <laughs> between China and Russia and us saying, let's not do that? That's exactly don't, right. Don't do that. That's exactly right. Because you go into that race, there's no, you know, who's going to win that race? Are we going to win it? Is China going to win it? Is Japan going to win it? I mean, this is, you don't want to put, your key economic assets at risk this way, or your military assets. So it's in our interest to negotiate a, what they call an anti, anti-satellite anti weapon treaty. Yeah, and this has been an idea that's been around. It's been blocked by those who want to build these weapons. We're, <laughs> okay, we're, who, we're waiting who are for they? Somebody. Who are they? <laughs> well, oh. First, there's the people. I mean, in all of this, in all of this, you got to go back to the money. You know, it's follow the money. Who's making the money off of these of these weapons? And there's the big five defense contractors: Boeing and Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics, etc. And then there's the the politicians who represent states where these weapons are built or are beneficiaries of campaign contributions. And then on top of that, and only then on top of that, do you have the sort of strategic debate: the experts who are funded by think tanks or institutes. The reason we have uh, talked about a space force is to bring the Chinese to the table, you see, on the treaty on anti-satellite anti weapons. And uh, I, I'm speaking now for President Trump. He has thought this through, and uh, that ha that's why he is acting kind of like a buffoon uh, about the Space Force, but he's really actually uh, playing three-dimensional chess. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. That's, yes. That's what's happening here, and that's what's happening pretty much with everything he, he does. He's, that's right. Yes. So you can put a strategic veneer on any stupid idea and make it sound... I don't understand why they don't just get someone like that. But that, that is their spokesperson. <laughs> 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 That's right. You, what do you they just have? don't understand how brilliant this guy is. <laughs> and uh, some of this is secret, so we can't really, I can't give you complete answers often. But <laughs> let, let me just tell you that uh, just being in the man's presence, well, the level of detail, uh, boy, what he takes home to the residents at night and uh, devours. <laughs> it's just amazing, and you know it's funny when when people experts come in to to brief uh, President Trump. Uh, so often he is way ahead of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, have you ever seen a photo of President Trump carrying a briefcase, carrying it's folders? His, it's all in his. He does it electronically. Yeah, yeah. He's very, yeah. very. Uh, He's a great listener. Tech savvy. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah. he likes to be underestimated. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and he is succeeding. Okay, let's talk about Israel and, of course, the, uh, the Tlaib and Omar, uh, the two congresswomen, um, who were basically denied entrance into uh, Israel. 
I do think we're at a turning point in America's relationship w with Israel and maybe Israel's relationship w with us. And I, I speak about this from both a sort of political angle, somebody who's been in the national security field for 35 years in this town, but also a personal angle. Uh, I'm not Jewish, but my, my family is. My wife is Jewish. My kids are Jewish. My grandchildren are Jewish. Many, many, many of my friends uh, are Jewish. And I've I'm seen Jewish. the change. You're Jewish. I'm Jewish. I, 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 I don't like to say it. <laughs> So, so I've seen the change. I mean, I've, we've, I've seen the change in, in, in my lifetime. I and mean, my wife, you know, my family was strong supporters of Israel. My wife was in Young Judea. My my in laws made Aliyah. They they emigrated to so Israel. That means they they're they, citizens they, of Israel. But they, yes. they made it and they they stayed there. They stayed there. I see. I see. My sister, my I got a niece and nephew in the IDF. A goddaughter went in the IDF. Was a sniper on the guys at Gaza yeah. Strip. And I've seen this change from a period where, where Americans, not just Jewish Americans, but Americans, you know, s s had strong support, visceral support for Israel. Well, this, bipartisan, the, complete uh, bipartisan absolutely. support. I mean, this was the brave new nation. This was the security for the Jewish people. This was the refuge for Jews from all over the world. These were the young, beautiful people building a new society. And it wasn't just about security. It was about a new ideas, about new values, the kibbutz movement, make the deserts bloom. Yeah, is well, that this, how uh, you uh, think of Israel now? No. Of course not. You think of uh, Netanyahu, you think of Sharon, you think of... Walls and uh, barbed wire and armed forces and keeping a million people in the largest open-air prison settlement. in the world, Gaza Strip. Yeah. And you think of the settlers. And you, 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 you know, you think, you think of all this. And, you, and, and, and what that means, what that means is that uh, Jewish American sentiment, American sentiment has waned. We no longer identify with Israel. My kids don't care about Israel. They both did birth, birthright trips. They both went mm -hmm. over there. They enjoyed Birthright the trips trip. is, are, are trips that uh, American Jews uh, get. They're, they're paid for, right? Free. Yeah, free trip to, to Israel. And, um, they, yeah. you know. It's, a, it's an immersive experience. A lot of, most people come back liking it, but they don't identify. Israel is not one of their priorities. It's not politically. They don't vote on Israel. They don't contribute. On the to other Israel. hand, though, there is this BDS movement, which is active on campuses, which I think is dangerous. But if you, you know, it, that's one. Baby wing. Netanyahu is someone who it's really hard to look right. at this guy and go like, yeah, I really want to get behind Israel, <laughs> you know. And and building these settlements to make it impossible to have a two-state solution, I, I don't understand it. And what the Republicans have done, what McConnell did, what Trump is doing now, is not in Israel's long-term interest. Absolutely not. And this is the this is the political element of this now, because BB has changed this. You know, when he was first elected, my family thought he was an aberration. He was a buffoon, a thug, a clown. And in fact, he, you know, he, he, was, he only had a short first term, but then he came back. And he's now the longest sitting prime minister in Israel history. And he has fundamentally transformed Israel in part because Israel's population has changed since the collapse of the Soviet Union. A lot of different immigration has, has happened in Israel, a much more conservative base that supports his kind of what I would consider racist policies and 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 policies that support a permanent occupation, even annexation of the West Bank. And then it's not just that how bad those policies were, because many politicians have supported that. It's the way he translated that into the U.S.-Israel relation. He made it a partisan relationship. He, he had done, and, and McConnell and uh, went right along with it. The went right along Party. with it. So he violated the cardinal rule. You know, you, you support, you work with Republicans and Democrats. No. He's working with the Republicans. He's clearly made an alliance with the Republican president of the United States. The Republican president has made an alliance with him. And it's an alliance between two autocratic leaders, not between two peoples, not between two nations. It's not in Israel's national security interest to have this, to break this bond. And you see it transforming in front of our eyes. And the decision to deny uh, admission to Israel, to the West Bank, for two members of Congress happened to be the first two Muslim women elected, I, I think is just is part, what is that tipping point is where it starts to really demonstrably goes the other way, and you start Crazy. breaking you start breaking the bond between I, I, the Israeli people 
and and the the U.S. Congress. All of this breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that Netanyahu is doing it. It breaks my heart that the settlers are are making it impossible. I think to put together a two state solution. It breaks my heart that we have missiles coming from Gaza. I was born in 1951 in the shadow of the Holocaust. I understand why yes. Israel's there. Right. I don't think most people understand what percentage of the Jewish population of the world were eliminated during the Holocaust. It was like more than a third. Yeah. And this was an attempt to eliminate Jews from the planet. And and if you look at the history, this was the ancient homeland of the Jews. There's no, and for a long friggin' time, mm -hmm. okay, Abraham is what, 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So this was, <laughs> this was a long time, but Jews got kicked out of Israel. We lost some, uh, some battles there and have been uh, going throughout the world and everywhere they went, they would be successful until a certain point and then kicked out, yes. if not killed. Yes. And so finally, after the Holocaust, I mean, we were blamed. When I say we, I meant, you know, Jews were blamed for the plague, mm -hmm. the Great Plague. I mean, that was um, uh, Jews were poisoning wells. So we would just have to go from, and my grandparents, came from Russia uh, because of pogroms, yeah. right? And I do think that part of this loss of support for Israel is due to the further we get away from the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's part of it. And then part of it is the fault of Israel. And part of it is the fault of the situation to begin with, which was that, okay, for centuries, Jews have been persecuted and oppressed and killed, and now this Hitler guy almost mm -hmm. eliminated them. They need a, a homeland, and that's what the international community did. Mm -hmm. And the only problem was that there are other people living there. Yes. So you need a political solution to that, and the solution is not to drive Israel into the sea, but it's also not to occupy Palestine and expel Palestinians from their historic uh, land. You need a two-state solution. And that's why you need a Jared Kushner <laughs> to, come in. to come in and find the solution. Well, there you have it. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm sorry these were such heavy topics and we... Well, we had a lot of laughs over the heavy <laughs> topics, and that's what the uh, the Al Franken podcast is all about. Is, uh, Laughing at the darkness. That's right. We don't curse the darkness. We laugh at it. <laughs> See you all next time on the Al Franken podcast.